Hi, I'm Christopher Warnock of Renaissance Astrology, and in this video we're going to focus on Venus, and I'm also going to introduce my new amazing uh, Venus Sufi Libra talisman. It's very cool. So if we pull back a little bit and we look at Renaissance Astrology, we recognize that it really aspires to be a universal language for the description of reality. And let that sink in a little bit. This is uh, a method then to understand reality in all its complexity. And then in particular, we have an emphasis on using our understanding to make accurate and concrete predictions of the future. If we understand reality, we can see what's happening now, we can see what's gonna happen in the future and also understand what's happened in the past. And then we can go further with that because astrology, or in, in particular medieval Renaissance astrology, provides a methodology to interact with reality. So not just see what's going on, but actually interact with it at the celestial uh, level. So even at this level, and true it's every level, but at the celestial level we have infinite interfaces uh, in order to interact with uh, the reality. Again, using uh, astrology as a method of understanding and then using astrology as the uh, methodology of interaction. So again, this brings us to astrological magic, to talismans, to celestial devotion. Really, in a sense, we're sort of looking at this as a magical level, using our internal will to cause external changes. That's sort of the, the magical paradigm. And if we even go further with it, we can see uh, medieval Renaissance astrology as a method of orientation. Again, universal orientation. Where are we? Uh, when are we? Where are we going? But instead of trying to uh, mold external reality to fit our desires, we align ourselves with reality. We accept the guidance of uh, reality, and we do this, uh, again, through uh, a celestial means, through celestial guidance. Uh, and this fits very well with celestial devotion, but this is the practice that I take. So again, if we think of this uh, astrology as a language, essentially what we're dealing with is a, a system of patterned interactions. And you can think of music. I mean, music has an extremely logical level to it. I mean, if you look at, you know, someone takes music and they could do sheet music, you know, they can put down every little note, they can do the tempo, they can show all the interactions, the chords, you can see all the incredible mathematical interactions and similarities and, and um, everything that's going on, octaves, etc., etc. At the same time, if you know nothing about the theory of music, you know nothing about reading music, you can listen to it and you have an immediate emotional and intuitive response to it. So it has this incredible co combination of that, and astrology is similar to that. There is a tendency to kind of want to follow the scientific thing and you know reduce everything to, to statistics, to computerizing it, to algorithms. The flip side of that, or the other end of the spectrum, again, is one that's followed traditionally and certainly is uh, in play in uh, medieval Renaissance astrology, which is to, to think in terms of personalities and persons. So when we take that approach, our key persons or personalities in medieval Renaissance astrology are really the planets. I mean, every celestial factor has an angel. So every celestial factor is personified in that sense. But the, the key personalities that we're looking at, whose interactions are really focused on, which isn't to say you couldn't do it another way, but the reality of how we handle it in medieval Renaissance astrology is that we're very often looking at the planets. And this is certainly an approach that's familiar in modern astrology. They're the celestial factors that everybody is most familiar with. Now again, you can think of the planets as these physical objects, right? Uh, and they're radiating beams. And this certainly is an approach that it's taken by the majority of people that are that are doing astro modern astrology. Um, it doesn't upset sort of basic, basic atheistic materialistic worldview, um, which is fine, except there's no scientific evidence that this is happening. So to go ahead and say, well, we want to conform to science, and then science rejects it is a, is a kind of a strange uh, no man's land to be stuck in. Um, so uh, if we go ahead with the idea of the plants as personalities, uh, they have, you know, uh, they're a person, you know, and we can interact with them on that level. And then they have qualities. Again, if you're a person, you have a personality. You have your good side, your bad side, you have things you like, you have things you dislike, things you're good at, things you're not good at, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very useful way of sort of uh, as an interface. And you don't have to worry about the underlying reality that comes along with it if that starts to bother you. I mean, in the Buddhist view, there's no self, so even a human person is really an abstraction. It's nothing more than sort of a technical labeling of a bunch of behaviors happening at the same time. But for our purposes, 
It's a really great way of interacting. If you react to other people as a personality, it's a great way. I mean, again, animals, plants, if you react to them as persons, that's a really good model for understanding how to interact with them and, and to, to work with them. So again, if we think of the seven plants together, if we think of their complete interactions at any particular moment, it's a unified expression of reality at that particular moment. And then again, extending this metaphor, if we know the planet's personality, we can understand a key facet of that particular piece of reality. So again, as I was saying today, this video is going to focus on Venus. And so, I mean, I think right from the get-go, you know, uh, uh, Venus is typically in, the, in, in Western astrology manifested as a woman. And again, this is archetypal. I mean, every, every human has this archetypal male and female qualities. Um, it doesn't really relate to physical gender, you know, and then there's all sorts of, you know, and I think that's helpful nowadays. I mean, I think with all the gender fluidity and everything that's going on, you know, people come and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm gay or whatever. So is Venus. I'm like, Venus is love for everybody, for example. I mean, we're looking at Venus really often as in a magical standpoint is for love. And so that's really, to me, the universal uh, planet for love. And I don't, you know, go in and try to, you know, say, oh, well, you know, this, you're this kind of person or gender or whatever like that, lack of gender, and so you need another planet. I mean, I suppose you could do that. But from my view, Venus is going to contain all those uh, possibilities, is going to contain all genders, um, and is going to be uh, universally usable for love. So if we really want to understand a planet, um, one of the most useful things we can do as an exercise is to look at the... Uh, planetary rulership lists that appear in our medieval renaissance sources uh, and i've got links to that on my website you can take a look at that we've got uh, william lilly from the uh, 17th century we've got uh, cornelius agrippa uh, from the 15th century um, 16th century and then excuse me and then you've got uh, al Biruni, who's uh, 10th century uh, i tend to kind of like lilly but, you know, one of the things about planetary rulership lists is that people want to know what the right answer is. And again, when you think about planetary rulership, the reality is every object in the material world, everything, is going to contain all seven planets. Uh, and just in differing, uh, differing degrees and differing uh, levels of influence. And so, for example, a rose, we typically would say, oh, a rose is ruled by Venus because we're focused on the qualities of beauty. It smells, you know, nice. Uh, and those are ruled by Venus. But the thorns of a rose are ruled by Mars, the sap is ruled by Jupiter, the roots by Saturn, etc., etc. So it really depends on what quality you're focused on. And then even, and even then, you're going to have different planets that are going to be in the mix, as well as fixed stars. I mean, when you think about this whole view of occult virtue, which is one of the major uh, uh, medieval Renaissance views of, of, of how things work, the occult virtue, they're flowing through many different kinds of channels. So the mage is the one who goes and out all these different things. So to say, oh, X is ruled by Y, yes, if you're looking at this particular perspective. And there's, again, all the different ways of looking at it. I mean, gold is another good example. I mean, gold is uh, bright, you know, it's yellow, um, so it's the sun. It's valuable, so it's ruled by Jupiter. It's heavy, so it's ruled by Saturn. So again, to say, what's the rulership of gold? Depends on what quality and what you're interested in. And it's much more complex. It's not this reductionist, one right answer kind of thing that people are tending to look at. So let's take a look at Venus. Um, let's look at the planetary rulerships of Venus. Uh, and again, let's go to Picatrix, which is one of our key traditional sources written in thousand, translated into uh, Castilian uh, Spanish and then Latin at the court of Alfonso the Wise in 1256, and then radiating throughout the esoteric community in both the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And it says, Venus is the source of the power of flavor. And she rules grammar and the art of measuring sound and song. Among languages, she has Arabic. Among internal organs, the right nostril. Internal organs, those that meet in sexual intercourse and project sperm and the stomach. And they're from those from which come virtue and flavor of eating and drinking. So again, we can see sort of the patterns here. It says, among religion, Islam. It's interesting that Venus rules both Arabic and Islam. Among clothing, all painted clothing. Professions, all professions of painting and shaping. You can see the art. Selling things that smell good, we mentioned that with, uh, with uh, the rose. Playing instruments that are good to listen to. Singing, dancing, making stringed instruments, so pleasure. Um, flavors, all sweet things that taste good, and that makes perfect sense. Uh, places, places of vice, places in which men seek healing, in which men dance. Places of cheerfulness, in which there's singing and speech. Places of ladies and beautiful women, and also places of eating and drinking. 
So again, you can kind of see this patterning here of love, pleasure, enjoyment, but also said the vice there. So this is the Venus. And, and for every planet, for everything, there's a, there's a positive side and a negative side. There's a dark side and a light side. And this is just in part of the nature of reality. And if we try to, if we get freaked out by the, the dark side, again, we repress it, then it comes out even more strongly. Um, uh, it says, okay, again, with Picatrix, uh, plus she rules, uh, Venus rules precious stones, pearls, rocks, lapis lazuli, uh, plants, plants with a good odor like saffron, roses, see there's roses again, flowers with a good odor and smell that are pleasant to look at, among medicines, balsam, julep, those that emit a strong smell, such as nutmeg and amber, so sweet as well. Among animals, females, camels that are beautiful, all beautiful animals with symmetrical bodies, such as gazelles, sheep, hares, partridges, and the like. And it says, among colors, sky blue and gold tending a little to green. So again, you can see how the Venus is really diffused throughout all things in the material world. So all things that have these similar qualities are unified, in a sense, in Venus. They're all connected. Uh, they have similar occult virtues. They have similar spirit. They're connected together. And they really, again, it's even more than connection. They're, they're a unity. There's a unification there. And that unification is personified and then can be interacted with in, in terms of Venus. So, again, we really have this, uh, again, a much more complex and uh, you know, uh, in, intuitive and emotional as well as rational way of interacting with this uh, nature of reality. Um, so when we look at that in terms of uh, the magical quality, like for example, in terms of talismans, we're typically going to be thinking about Venus talismans as being talismans. I mean, the premier talisman for love is going to be Venus, but also for friendship, uh, for pleasure, um, also arts and music and creativity. So these are the kind of the, the, the standard goals that people are looking for um, when they when they uh, turn to a Venus talisman. Um, and Venus talismans, again, I have a, there's many different ways of looking at your chart. Um, lots of different ways of prescribing talismans based on your chart. What I tend to do, and again, this is just my methodology, there's again, like I said, other ways to do it, is to look at Venus in the natal chart and to see whether Venus uh, is in, in detriment um, either in Aries or Scorpio or in Fall in Virgo. And in that case, I would say it's a question mark. I'd say that's a sort of a caution. It doesn't mean it's deadly, but it's a question mark. Same thing as Venus is a retrograde without dignity, without any essential dignity, or combust without any essential dignity. But for example, if she was dignified by term and combust, that would be fine. Dignified by face and retrograde, that would also be fine. So it said in detriment or fall in the natal chart, or uh, retrograde or combust without essential dignity. And in that case, I would say a question mark. And what you want to do then is to do some more divination, perhaps. Uh, I often use I Ching, you know, like for a specific talisman, or you could say for Venus talismans in general. And just to be a little cautious about, you know, your interaction. But it doesn't mean you have to be freaked about a Venus or Venus is deadly or something like that. It's just kind of giving a question mark. On the other hand, if Venus is in Libra or Taurus, uh, which are her, she rules, or, or Pisces, or Exaltation, and like, wow, these are really positive. You already have a good relationship with Venus. You're likely to get really good results from Venus. Or if Venus is in any other sign other than we mentioned that, other than, um, you know, where she's peregrine or has essential dignity, then she's perfectly fine. That's an excellent choice for you. Um, so, again, I've had people that have had the plants afflicted in their natal chart use the talismans of that planet, and they've worked really well for them. So you just want to do some additional... Um, the investigation and do some divination. Like I said, you could do tarot, you could do pendulum. I tend to do I Ching and just see what it says about a specific talisman that you're interested in or working with Venus. The other thing you can do is a low intensity practice. Uh, for example, planetary charity, you can always do planetary charity. There's a link for that. And, or you can do the daily planetary practice. Again, it's a low intensity practice. You're just doing planetary hour, basically a planetary day of the planet. It's such a low intensity practice that you can use it for any planet, no matter what they are in your chart. Um, so, as I said, you know, for Venus talismans are typically going to be, uh, f you know, people are going to focus on love, friendship, pleasure, arts, music, and creativity. People say, oh, about, what about wealth? Well, again, I've seen modern stuff saying Venus is good for wealth. The problem of kind of making things whatever you want it to be, you know. Um, and, and my sense of it is Venus, she loves to spend money. I mean, she loves all these pleasures and everything and loves having money around but is not really that great about going out and earning it or even focusing on getting the money. It's really the, the enjoyment of it is what, 
what Venus is focused on is, is the basic sort of what I'd say feel or energy of Venus. However, there are some specific Venus talismans that 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 are good for uh, her basic qualities. Like I said, love, friendship, pleasure, but also add wealth into the mix. And so one of those is our new Venus Sufi a Libra talisman. Uh, now this is a limited edition talisman. Um, if you're looking at this video too much after May of uh, 2024, these are probably sold out. We've only got a very few, very few of them. We have actually have six of them, which is a very small number of them. So these are the Venus Sufi magic talismans. Very cool talisman. One of the things I like about this talisman, this is an, an inch talisman. Usually our talismans are about an inch and a half, and um, it's it's nice and thin. So it's a great talisman to wear. You could even sort of do a charm bracelet thing or, or something like that with it. It wouldn't bounce around. It's not too heavy. Uh, great talisman. Uh, and it adds a Sufi magic to it. It's got this divine names. It's got the additional uh, power that comes from that. And this is also uh, a, a wealth talisman as well as being for love uh, as, and even adds fame and success. So very cool talisman. Um, and, you know, it's, it's unusual. And talismans, again, tend to be pretty focused. You know, they tend to be stick to, their, to the just a few uh, goals. And so when you have multiple factors and multiple things that they can accomplish, it's actually really cool. Um, and so here's the standard Venus image that goes with it. You can see the standard image of Venus. Really beautiful image. Uh, this is the uh, consecration image that comes with uh, with the, the Sufi uh, Libra talismans and our you know basic uh, Venus talismans. Um, and I actually have one other talisman I want to mention. That's like I said gives the basic Venus love, um, you know friendship, uh, pleasure, as well as being a wealth talisman. And this is the uh, Venus Three Graces talisman. And this is a, a Picatrix talisman. The image from Pictrix is um, three women embracing each other, and I thought, wow, it'd be really cool, and just had a brain flash to uh, use Botticelli's Venus, uh, the, the, excuse me, the Three Graces from the, the Primavera by Botticelli. Um, and just a gorgeous image, and again, you can see that that's the, the image here on the, the talisman as well. And this, according to Picatrix, also is a wealth talisman. So again, you can see the link to that. Very unusual talismans. Like I said, check those out. Um, I think that that's um, you know a really cool way of adding these additional. And, and these are specialized uh, Venus talismans that have that additional power. Um, very unusual. So again, within my whole celestial devotion, when I look at Venus, um, you know, part of the way of looking at it. I mean, again, the typical way of looking at a talisman as is, is this battery. The magic is in the talisman. It's charged with a sort of impersonal energy of the planet. And what it does is it goes out and gets what I want. And it forces reality to conform to what I want. Um, and so, you know, while people aren't articulating that, that's kind of the underlying assumptions of what's going on with it, which is fine. I mean, I'm not saying that's wrong. There is, however, an alternative to that. Again, that comes, like I said, with this devotional approach, uh, which is seeing the talisman as a means of contact with the angels and archangels of the planet. So again, a Venus talisman is a way of getting in touch with the angels and archangels of Venus um, to form a personal relationship. And the magic is not in the talisman. Um, you know, the, the magic is coming from the relationship with the, the planetary angels. Um, and in a sense, what you're doing is in getting in contact with them and forming this personal relationship, you're unifying the inner and outer Venus. Because as I said, everything in the material world contains all seven planets. You have Venus within you. Uh, and Venus outside of you and Venus within you are both connected. And more than that, they're a unity. But what you want to, want to do is to bring it to consciousness to help it manifest more. And so definitely, you know, and you could almost look at it as an attunement. You think of like you're tuning up the musical instrument. And if you tune the two strings and you pluck one, the other vibrates in unity with it. And essentially that's what's coming. You're making sure that you can tune yourself and vibrate uh, with the celestial angel of Venus and then manifest those qualities. So again, part of the influence is, yes, you can definitely have an outside influence. Yes, you can influence the external world, but also there's an incredible internal influence as well. Help you become more loving. If you want love, very helpful. Um, you're open to love, or again, for these specialized wealth talismans, to, the Venus talismans for wealth to be attuned to wealth. Um, so the typical kind of results that people come back to me with Venus talismans are saying things like, you know, I was much more relaxed in social settings. I was having more fun going out. I was uh, 
people that I was attracted to are more attracted to me. I was having these great social interactions. Uh, another one that comes up a lot is an old boyfriend or girlfriend like all of a sudden start contacting me. Uh, it's almost like ringing their, you know, the, the, you know, tuning up into them and ringing the, the bell for them. Now, some people will say, you know, I want to get X back or I want to have Y as my boyfriend. That's a little harder. That type of magic where you're trying to get a specific effect is going to be much more difficult to get. Um, it's also is somewhat coercive, isn't it? I mean, either you're talking about forcing them back or at least you're like changing them. You're doing some sort of mind control or something against what their current view is. Um, it does seem to be that that's not, I mean, that's possible. But again, that type of magic, uh, and I've seen it in hoodoo, uh, you kind of have to keep renewing it. I mean, you have a personal item of their clothing or something or their hair and you do, you know, do the hoodoo stuff with it and you can kind of draw them in, but you got to keep doing that. And again, it's kind of coercive, a kind of a mind control sort of thing. So if you really think about that, about what's going on with that, you might think, well, maybe that's, I, I do or don't want to do that. I mean, do you, would you want to have it done to you? Well, that's a good question. Um, so in a celestial uh, devotion approach, we're looking at Venus as an angel. Venus is looking out for our best interest. Um, and, and so if this, you know, if this person is not right for us, the situation's not right for us, then the angel's, you know, gonna not, typically not gonna be putting us in that direction. Now, right there, that's something that people are gonna say, well, I don't want that. You know, I don't wanna just be begging the, the, the uh, spirits for, you know, uh, f, you know, for charity. I want what I want and I want it now and go out there and get it for me. Now, and I think that's the, part of the attraction of a sorcery or demons or whatever. And again, that's fine. If that's your path, if that's what's effective for you, that's what you're doing, then you go ahead and do that. What I see from that is a, a good amount of false promises uh, from sorceress or demonic magic and also blowback. Um, whereas, you know, typically I think with an angelic magic, the worst effect you get is no discernible effect. But again, you have to find the, the path that resonates for you. So you know, really fascinating. I think anytime you go into something deeply, you get a really, you know, you get a, a view of reality. You know, and I think that's one of the, the most amazing things about medieval Renaissance astrology is the incredible complexity of the technique because it maps the incredible complexity of reality and allows us to have uh, accurate uh, focused predictions. You know, for example, horror is incredible and even natal astrology can do some amazing predictive stuff with it with the medieval Renaissance, but also an astrological magic allowing us to create talismans. And like I said, the, and if you take a celestial devotional approach, it opens up these vistas in terms of using it as part of your spiritual path. And again, all of these come from the fact that, again, that uh, medieval Renaissance astrology aspires, like I said, to be a universal language of reality, a universal point of contact, universal point of understanding, and really a universal point, a part of orientation. So I hope you'll check out our new Sufi uh, Venus talismans, all our Venus talismans, and um, think about this as part of your journey, both magically uh, and, and spiritually.